I, I am just overwhelmed at the number of people that came here today. So I just want to thank everybody and raise a clap for all of you for coming. The Diversity Task Force is a committee that um, will foster civic engagement and creating programs that promote a culture of respect and inclusiveness regardless of age or race, religion, national origin, uh, sex, disability, or familiar status. Um, the task force is appointed by the town manager, Jim Malloy, uh, school superintendent, uh, Dr. Julie Hackett, and includes Lexington residents who are committed to the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I'm going to introduce the members of the task force, some who could not be here today, but I'm going to, if they can just raise their hands, uh, Nira Najira Baja, uh, she's not here today, uh, Janice Litwin, Corin Stembridge, who was so graciously gave us the use of, this, of the library today, uh, Megan, Megan Klein Hattori, uh, Casey Lynn, Hope Klebenox, Hua Wang, Valerie Overton, and Wei John Wang. Thank you. Um, this is the first, as I said, we're launching a series of conversations that will be focused on identifying action steps, things that we can really do, that we can implement individually, um, in our neighborhoods, um, local businesses and in our local town government as well as the schools um, that will encompass issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're going to have continue this. We'll have future conversations. We'll take place at different dates and different times of day in order to enable as many people as possible to be included. Uh, we'll also be facilitating neighborhood block parties uh, around Lexington within the next several months. And the goal of that is to help us to get to know each other, to get to know each other better and to build a more collective sense of community. And we'll have more to come on that. Um, we, there is a sign-up sheet somewhere here. And if you're interested, we would really love to have you just put your name, your phone and email so that we can keep in touch, we can keep track and you can keep track with us. And we also have a Gmail um, that you can send us emails. It's lexingtondei at gmail.com. And Megan is writing that uh, right now. Uh, we also, uh, we thought that with everything happening in our country today, it, we, we had so many things that came off our agenda and on our agenda, but the one thing that remained on the agenda was we wanted to hand out copies of the Constitution so that people can have it, people can look at it when they want, and just remember, help remember really who we are. And I'd like to thank um, Eileen Zalisk for getting us those um, constitutions. Where is Eileen? Somewhere. Oh, yes, 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 thank you so much. We also have Samantha Hattori, who is in the back. Have Samantha, oh, she's over here. And she's gonna help us with the constitution. So if you need one, see Samantha. Oh, okay, so in the audience we have with us, I wanted people to say hello to our superintendent, Dr. Julie Hackett. And we have our state senator, Mike Barrett. Yeah. And we also have our state representative, Michelle Chicolo. And he has a strong believer in diversity and equity. I wonder if you two would like to say hi or say anything or... Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, I do not have talking points prepared. I um, am just so pleased to be here this morning and really so proud of our community and thrilled at the turnout. Um, as Melanie said, it's 
it's inspirational to know that here in Lexington, in our community, we do the right thing and we care about inclusive, <coughs> inclusivity and diversity. Um, so I'm just thrilled to join you all in learning what we can do to make sure that we continue marching forward and doing the right thing here in Lexington. Thank you. My thanks to the committee, to you, Melanie, uh, to the public library. I don't need to mention to anybody here that everything we're about to talk about uh, has suddenly become a high-stakes proposition. Uh, the idea of America that we all grew up with has suddenly been called into question in the last several years. Uh, all our assumptions about the kind of country we are and that we aspire to be are being challenged. It's a remarkable development, one that many of us did not foresee how encouraging it is to see all of us gathered here to push back against this fundamental questioning of what the United States of America is to be all about. My district uh, includes uh, a goodly portion of Lexington, but also the city of Waltham. And uh, I attended a health fair yesterday morning, sponsored by the Charles River Community Health Center. Waltham is immediately uh, adjacent, of course, to our town. Uh, it was wonderful to see the turnout yesterday. Very large uh, attendance on the part of Hispanic Waltham, Spanish-speaking Waltham. Waltham is a port of entry, a gateway city for many folks from Central America. So every terrible thing that's been said about Central American and Central Americans uh, is reverberating in the community immediately next to ours. You go around and you talk to people at the booths, you speak with people who sign up mothers with young children for the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children program, a nutrition supplement program. Sign ups way down because uh, Folks from Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras, citizens, many of them, non-citizens perhaps in some cases, are all too scared to register their children who are American citizens for a legitimate state government program focused on nutrition. They don't want to be anymore on government lists maintained in the United States. That is a profoundly distressing thought, a new development, one that we've got to do something about. You stop by the booths having to do with registering American citizens to vote. Registrations in South Waltham are way down. Citizens of the United States don't want to see their family names enrolled for fear of who might scrutinize those lists for other purposes. Every challenge we read about in the newspapers is coming home to roost in Massachusetts, in Waltham, and in our community. And we've got to do something about it. And that's why it's so important that you've turned out this morning to begin to push back. So I want to thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we're going to begin. Um, with the program. I'm going to introduce our two speakers, um, our town manager, Jim Malloy, and then we're going to have our um, JJ Jackson, a Lexington, Florida resident, <laughs> who um, is an expert in diversity and equity issues. So, uh, Mr. Malloy. I'm sorry, I'm going to steal your thunder just for a second, Jeff. Um, I just want to say to people who are out in the back, we have seats up front, so please feel free to come up front so you can see and hear better. Um, if you want to stand out back, you can, but we do have seats up front here. Thank you. So what I wanted to talk about was um, what is specifically diversity, inclusion, and equity, and why it's important in local government. 
Uh, several years ago, when I first served on the um, International City Managers Association Board of Directors, I had the opportunity to be that board's liaison to a task force on um, diversifying local government management. And uh, when, I, when I started that process, what I did is I wanted to find out what, what were the standard accepted um, definitions in the public sector for diversity, inclusion, and equity. And they're pretty dry. Um, but I, I, I want to, I've kept them on my cell phone, because so I put them on my cell phone so I can remind myself once in a while. But I just wanted to read, uh, read them out and then tell you what my thoughts are about them. So diversity represents the full spectrum of human demographic differences. Race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, age, socioeconomic status, and physical disability. You can also consider lifestyles, personality characteristics, perspectives, opinions, family composition, or educational level. Inclusion is very different from diversity because it won't make a material long-term difference to an organization to be diverse unless the people who fall into any one demographic feel welcomed. Inclusion refers to a cultural and environmental feeling of belonging. And this one's even worse. The National Academy of Public Administration defines equity <laughs> as the fair, just, and equitable management of all institutions serving the public directly or by contract the fair, just, and equitable distribution of public services and implementation of public policy, and the commitment to promote fairness, justice, and equity in the formation of public policy. So those are all good standard definitions, but the way I look at it, and an easier way for me to frame these issues, is that diversity is similar to inviting all types of people to a dance, and inclusion is actually asking them to dance. Um, when it comes to equity, uh, Arist I, I passed something out, but Aristotle tied equity to ethics, which I think is really important, and wrote, the man who possesses character excellence does the right thing at the right time in the right way. And so the little cartoon um, picture that I had the staff here hand out shows where the tall guy really did the right thing in the right way. Um, it's the difference between equality, where they all have the same size box, and equity where they all have the same opportunity, in this case, to watch a baseball game. Uh, but it's a good uh, description of really what equity is all about. And so, why is diversity, inclusion, and equity important to local government? And maybe more specifically, why is it important to me? So, I have a very strong belief, and the reason why I'm a local government manager is that I believe that local government has a direct impact on the daily lives of our citizens much more than uh, state or federal governments. Decision making that includes diverse constituencies develops better, more creative solutions that more quickly reflect the community's broad range of individuals, their experiences, their sensitivities, and what their concerns are. And why is it important to me? As a lifelong local government official, I'm now in my 32nd year and 57 years old, uh, I believe creating better communities begins with a commitment to pursuing diversity in, or in the organization so that it reflects the community. Equity, inclusion, and to work to mitigate the effects of bias in all areas of local government by developing and promoting programs and initiatives in the areas of service delivery, hiring practices, leadership development, community engagement, and workplace culture. And I'm going to admit this. As an older white, educated male, I reflect a long time standard for local government professional managers. And I understand that I suffer from white privilege. Our local governments are changing as our world changes, and we, we are becoming more diverse as well. And I see that my older white male demographic actually makes me a stronger messenger as a standard bearer for promoting diversity and inclusion in our communities. Lexington is undertaking our first demographic, demographic study right now of our employees to develop metrics that we can measure progress. And the select men, soon to be the select board, have made this issue one of their primary goals over the next year. In summary, these beliefs extend to everyone, regardless of their individual demographic, even those we may strongly disagree with and or may not share the beliefs of the majority of the residents of the community. Diversity, equity, and inclusion applies to all we just need to be a little bit more patient, polite, and less divisive, and disagree in an agreeable manner. And I just want to leave you with two quotes 
that I, uh, I like. So at times, I've actually had them taped to my computers in my office. The first one is uh, by Teddy Roosevelt. It's something that uh, he wrote in 1912, and that's that this country will not be a good place for any of us to live in if it is not a reasonably good place for all of us to live in. And then the other one is that conflict is inevitable, um, violence is not. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting us here to talk with you. And I hope what will happen today will actually be a conversation, because often when the topic is diversity, people sit in the audience the way you're sitting now and are talked to, are given definitions, uh, laws are reviewed, programs are assessed, etc., etc. But it comes down to a personal decision and interaction with you. Because the Constitution that that sweet child over there is handing out, she's almost as sweet as my grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> that Constitution means nothing if you're not living it. It means absolutely nothing. And a lot of us don't even know what it says anyway. But one thing we do know is how we treat our neighbor, how we treat strangers on the street, and the way we go about our lives, whether we have goodwill and good intentions and treating people the same way. That's what diversity comes down to. I was working with a group of faculty at the Harvard um, School of Government, and a faculty member, when I asked the faculty, how important is diversity to you? And one faculty member said something I thought was so profound, I've kept it all this time. He said, inclusion is the real work. Diversity is the result of inclusion. So when we talk about diversity, we can make all kinds of laws, affirmative action, um, the top 10% of your graduating class get to go to this school or that school. We can review all kinds of admissions folders, et cetera, et cetera. But what it comes down to is how are you treating the person? And what are your expectations of that person standing next to you, the one that you're passing on the street, the one who doesn't look like you, and because the person doesn't look like you, you feel a bit uncomfortable. But you never ask yourself why you feel uncomfortable. So why do you feel uncomfortable? Does a stranger invoke that kind of fear in you? And if so, you need to understand what is it you're afraid of. Um, Claude Steele is a noted scholar around issues of stereotype threat, around issues of diversity and inclusion. And he wrote a book called Whistling Vivaldi and other conversations about race and the way stereotypes map our lives. And all of us have stereotypes. Black, white, Asian, Latino, Latina, everybody has a bias because we're all human beings and we're born into these nests and we assume the values of the people who take care of us and a different set of people took care of me than took care of you. So naturally when you and I meet, we're going to have values that may clash and that may coincide. And the mark of the quality of the human being is how do we negotiate those times when our values clash? So Claude Steele in his book, Whistling Vivaldi, talked about this young man who was a student at the University of Chicago who had to walk through and this was a young black man, had to walk through um, a wealthy white neighborhood on his way to campus. And the young man noticed that whenever a white couple was coming from the opposite direction, if they had been laughing and joking and having a good time with each other, the minute they saw him, they clammed up, they got a little closer, the wife grabs the husband's hand. <laughs> or they cross the street, but they become quiet, the smiles go away, and the young man was upset. He's like, why am I having 
this kind of reaction from these people. What do they think I'm going to do to them? So he started humming Beatles tunes and whistling Vivaldi. I mean, what thug is going to be whistling Vivaldi? Right? And he found that he said he was pretty good at it. So when he started, when he noticed that when he was walking along whistling something from the Four Seasons or you know, Vivaldi, something from Vivaldi or the Beatles, the couple relaxed. The people were a little more receptive. So what does that say about the people who were first fearful? When they hear Vivaldi or Beatles tunes, does that invoke something that's familiar to them? And now maybe this guy isn't so scary after all. Uh, maybe. And you ask yourself all these questions because the person doesn't look like you. On the other hand, this young man is walking down the street on his way to class minding his own business and is feeling upset that he's eliciting this kind of reaction from total strangers who have no evidence that he's ever hurt anybody, ever. That's what we're grappling with when we talk about diversity and inclusion. And until there is soul searching on the part of every single one of us, we are forever going to be discussing these issues forever. And all the laws on the books are not going to change the way you feel. When you hear your doorbell ring, you open the door and there stands a black man and you suddenly think, oh my God, what's going to happen? The day you don't fear that again is when we have succeeded at inclusion and diversity. Overton is now going to facilitate the question and answer portion. Um, before we get started, I, I, was, I just want to um, just mention that we have some select, are we a, still a select board yet? Uh, okay, well, we have some here. We have um, Joe Pato is here, uh, Jill High is here, and Mark Sandine is here. So thank you for coming. Okay, Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate, I know that this is not necessarily the um, easiest day and time for everybody to come, and so I appreciate you making time. As Melanie said at the outset, we are going to have a series of uh, community conversations in different days and times so that um, hopefully many people with many different circumstances can attend. Um, just one other person I wanted to mention is that we also have, uh, uh, from the school board, we have Eileen Jay, and um, let's see, anyone else? Did we miss anyone else? <laughs> we have Matt Cohen, that Jody, <laughs> that Jody is <laughs> from town meeting. Um, so, and uh, Larry Freeman from town meeting. I suspect that we have others from town meeting. So, um, yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry, people were pointing. That's why I was <laughs> mentioning those names. So, I'm going to uh, just get right into it. Um, so, uh, today we're going to have a conversation about some big topics, right? And we can't possibly fully address these big topics. Uh, in an hour and a half or the hour or so that we have remaining. And so uh, Megan graciously wrote uh, the email address for the Diversity Advisory Task Force so that you, if you or others have thoughts that you would like to share later, please do. Um, we will also be holding other conversations to give more people opportunities. We would like to hear um, about kind of experiences and thoughts and ideas and suggestions that kind of represent our vision, our values around diversity, equity, and inclusion in Lexington. And so I'm going to pose a series of three questions um, that are big and abstract, but they'll be a starting point. And 
the feedback that we receive here and by email and future conversations will help inform the work that we do in constructing future community conversations and other initiatives. Um, and while this is kind of a foundational community conversation that will inform some of that work, we really do want this and the future community conversations to be action oriented. That is to generate specific, concrete, feasible, realistic actions that we can take as individuals and as neighborhoods and community and businesses and uh, the municipality, the school system and so forth. And so this is really gonna be foundational to lay the framework for those kind of action-oriented conversations that follow. Um, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, that's a very broad topic that's going to cover anything and everything in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also often talk about um, a welcoming and affirming environment for all kinds of people. One thing that I want to just note when we talk about a welcoming environment is that sometimes when we say welcoming, there's the idea that we are welcoming other people to join us here. And by setting up that dynamic, we are saying that we, often white, <laughs> you know, straight white people, um, are the norm, and we are welcoming others to the fold. That's not our, their, our vision of diversity, equity, and inclusion. When we welcome others here, we are setting up a dynamic where we are saying we are the norm, you are these people who we are graciously letting in. And so what we want to do is to assume that we are all here, we is the inclusion concept that JJ mentioned, that we are all here, we all have equal value, we all have equal legitimacy, we all have equal input. Um, and we welcome each other, right? So I just wanted to make that note because um, sometimes when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, we talk about kind of a welcoming place. And I just want to make clear, if I use the word welcoming, I am not saying that I, as a white person, am welcome, welcoming other people here. I'm saying that we as a community are including everyone and we are not saying that you know, I as a white person welcoming other people here. I am um, living the same as anybody else. All right, so with that, we're gonna get into conversation. So the way we'll work this is I will throw out kind of a broad initial question. I'm gonna ask um, members up here of the, the speakers and the Diversity Advisory Task Force to get us started by just sharing a few brief um, thoughts or reflections about the question and then we'll open it up to everybody. And we really do want to have this be a conversation. Um, so everybody's ideas are welcome. And um, then I'll kind of keep an eye on the, the clock. And um, we're, I'm not going to be very rigid about saying we're discussing this question now, and that question then, and then this question here, right? So the, the conversation is likely to kind of be fluid and flow here and there, and that's fine. So the first question that I wanted to pose to everybody is, um, again, it's a broad one. What do you see as Lexington's strengths and weaknesses currently in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion? That's a broad question. So your, so your thoughts can be um, also broad in terms of like a general characterization. It can also be kind of very specific in terms of um, individual kind of experiences and, and issues and so forth. All right, so um, shall we just go through the, the, go along the table and just have, you know, 30 seconds of, of response for each person? So I would say that uh, Lexington, one of the strengths is that a uh, long time ago when it formed the 2020 committee, it recognized that it was becoming a more diverse community and it was um, proactive in having a discussion about what was important and how they could begin to address the uh, diversity that was occurring in the community and not ignoring it. Well, as a short time resident of, of Lexington and recently moved away from Lexington, as in one week ago, 
um, one of the strengths that I noticed when I first moved here was how well run the town is. And when a city is well run with clear um, expressions of the, who the town is, where do you go for this, what does this department do and that department do, and I'm speaking now as a participant from the Citizens Academy. That is conducive to a strong diversity effort because people don't have to worry that somebody's going to get this kind of treatment, but I'm going to get that kind of treatment when all the rules and regulations are the rules and regulations. And the important thing is whether or not those are all applied equally. And as far as I could tell from the short time I lived here, they were, and I think that's an important strength. Um, my name is Casey, and um, when I moved to Lexington about four years ago, um, there were two things that um, really um, impressed me a lot, and I'm very proud to be a resident of um, Lexington because of these two things. One is the co-program, and I was very, very impressed that um, Lexington is so welcoming to um, kids from outside the community um, and give them opportunities for, for education whereby in their own environment maybe they did not have the same opportunities. So I'm very, very proud of that. And secondly, with um, uh, kids with disabilities, um, I think um, Lexington has, is very well resourced um, in terms of providing education to, to all kids, including kids with disabilities. And, um, and they are making um, great efforts in uh, making inclusion um, more important for the kids who have special needs. Hi, I had no idea what was going on with the microphone. Um, my name is Hope. I've uh, been here about four years, and like a lot of um, people in town, I, I moved to Lexington um, for my kids, for, for um, the schools. And um, I think that one of the things that struck me about the town is its earnestness and its wish to be better, to do better. It is a town full of perfectionists, that were, at least that's my experience. But I think that's not a bad thing. It's not just a superficial perfectionism at all. I think it extends to who we are, how we treat each other. We all want to believe the best of ourselves, most of us anyway. And in that effort, I think a lot of us are examining ourselves and our assumptions about who we are and how we treat those near to us. Um, as far as shortcomings go, I think that once in a while, we do get locked into our routines, um, into how we and those closest to us are doing. But everybody who came here, everybody who came today, everyone who's joined a committee trying to improve the lives of their kids and the people who we live near, is doing it for a reason. Um, and that's to sort of break free of that bubble, the bubble of, well, I'm okay. Um, I'd best wrap up before I ramble. Um, I'm thrilled that the turnout today is what it is. And that, to me, says everything that needs to be said about um, whether Lexington takes its diversity, equity, and inclusion seriously. Thanks. Hi, everyone. This is a wonderful turnout. <laughs> My name is Janice. I moved to Lexington uh, 20 years ago, almost to the day. Um, and probably, like many of you, we also moved here for the schools. But also for the community, we actually specifically were interested in how diverse the community was and the growing Asian population because our daughter came from China and we thought it important that she'd be in a place where many people looked like her and she could learn from other people who had come from her culture. Um, I think that the great strength is the very fact of the diversity and how increasingly diverse we are. I think the growing area is that it, there's still a potential for so much more. There's still so many, as people said, preconceptions, so many stereotypes. We're trying to inch there, but I still teach, see too much separateness, too many assumptions about one another, and that's what we're working on. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ray Don. 
uh, like everyone mentioned here, uh, we moved here uh, primarily for school. We moved here like more than 20 years ago. But ever since then, uh, I've been here uh, over 20 years ago. I've been talking with other friends, that many Chinese friends moving to Lexington. I, I know from first hand people saying uh, they come to Lexington, school aside, it's because they know Lexington has a better reputation for treating people like immig immigrant people. Uh, they, some people like, I, I don't want to mention other town's name, but they <laughs> love this town coming to Lexington because they think they heard good story about uh, Chinese people in Lexington feel better, uh, have better uh, representation or tongue in general treat them better. Now, that's not to say that we are done, right? we're, we're, we're the best, we don't need to do anything. That's why we're here today. And uh, uh, I, I think every community, because it's all affected by the bigger political atmosphere and it's more challenging for us in this environment how we can better come up together as one community for the for the good of the, the community. Okay. Yes, JJ, go ahead. Hi, I'm Megan. Um, one of the things that I'm always impressed with is that when something does go a little off the rails around town, there's kind of this community idea that um, response that this is not what we want to do and we can do better. Um, but one of the shortcomings that I've seen is that we haven't really been able to mobilize on that, and I'm hoping that that's one of the things that you know we'll all get out of that. I think everything that you've heard sounds very idealistic. And you would think we live in a perfect town. And you know we don't. Because if we did, we wouldn't be here having this discussion today. And there's one caution that I would like to say something about. The specter of affluence has a menacing effect on diversity. The specter. Because I know that not everybody in Lexington is rich. I was waiting for an amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> I even got applause over here. But because Lexington has this reputation and the school system is what it is, that's terrific. And a lot of people do move here for the schools. I moved here for my kids. Who moved here for the schools, for their kids. <laughs> and, and they say, we're not leaving and you need to come back. So anyway, when you walk around Lexington, or I've heard people who don't live in Lexington make comments about Lexingtonians, there is the specter of the stereotype threat that Claude Steele talks about. And that stereotype is all these snooty, snotty, rich people in Lexington who don't want anyone who is on, in Section 8 housing to live here. If that's not true, how do you get that message across so that people stop perceiving you in that way? Because perception becomes reality when you do nothing about it. And so when someone walks into, I have had the experience personally of walking into a store and having the impression, notice how I put that, having the impression that the person didn't want to wait on me. And I thought, now if I were wearing Oprah Winfrey diamonds and, you know, had my own TV studio and everybody knew it, Maybe I wouldn't be treated like that. But then, it, fortunately, it's only for the first few seconds because I don't let people treat me like that for more than a few seconds. <laughs> but not everybody has the agency to say, I'm, I'm not, whatever it is you're thinking about, I'm not that. It's like the young man whistling Vivaldi. I'm not that thug, I'm not going to hurt you. And so, there are different ways in which we whistle Vivaldi, 
But you need to know that if you need to hear someone whistling Vivaldi, then there's an opportunity for you to ask yourself, what in the world is going on with me? Again, say thank you to this really big crowd. Just so happy. We were so worried about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome. So, yes. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, we're going to have people speak in the mic so everyone can hear. Uh, with you, we respect Dr. JJ. Oprah was refused to get into the permit shop when yeah. she was in Europe. They did not recognize her. Amen. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm not that one. I just want to know, it's nice that we passed the Constitution, but how many people recognize three African Americans would count as three-fifths. It was not until the 13th Amendment during the Civil War, okay, that we have the African American Council for citizen. And I also have a problem. I've been here since 1992. Who has been here since 1992? Who has been here? Wonderful, great. We need them. We need to have more events in, 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 in this town. I just looking at all this diversity that you guys included. But the diversity are the people you want to include, <laughs> Mr. Sullivan. Well spoken, well mannered and will not wait and make any waves. <laughs> and next time when I talk, I do not want any one of you just simply how I dress, how I talk. Sit up, go sit up. It is, your time is up. And while the white male ran on and on, and he even tell us he went to MIT 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, Jim. I've, uh, I grew up, I'm Jim Shaw, I grew up in this town and um, I've seen it all, I'm a native, I've seen, welcomed and celebrated the changes and diversity that has come and this, this question is prompted by the last comments, uh, uh, particularly what JJ was talking about is um, affluence and um, I know this town has done a great deal, it's in the Vision 2020 plan under uh, the, the heading, is this the Lexington we want or, or the Lexington we want or something like that. Uh, there's a plank on economic diversity, and um, I know the town has done a lot of great things in terms of creating affordable rental units, but not since Muzzy have they done anything about affordable home ownership, um, which is a real state. When you really want to put down roots, if you're renting, you're transient, you can pick up and leave, you're not really vested in the community the way everyone else is. And I just was encouraging folks in the policy making chairs to, to consider that as you talk about, because I think we've done so much on diversity on a lot of fronts, but I think on that front, the town gets a C minus, and it's no reflection on the new town manager because I have great, great hope with um, Mr. Malloy. But the, um, but I think we have a long way to go in terms of getting people to really feel like they're here in this community. Bravo. Yeah, thank you. Um, Right, because we do want people with all different levels of affordability to be able to um, own houses so we don't have the barbell effect of like the rich and the people who are most needy. Um, so I know there were a few, uh, we'll just kind of go in order here. Thanks, Mel. Uh, I'm Grace Stevens. I've lived in Lexington since 1977, so that's 42 years. Um, um, that was before I had kids, but all my kids were raised, went through the school system here. JJ, I want to add, in addition to the specter of affluence, there's the specter of intelligence and achievement that's here in Lexington. I remember telling my kids not to worry how they performed in the schools, how they performed in the high school. Um, I, my daughter was actually lost in the middle ground that there was tons of ability for the low performing kids, the high performing kids were well taken care of on their own, but the kids in the middle got lost here. 
and they needed parental pushing and support on doing that. Um, for my kids, I told them, and this may be my opinion, people may disagree, the gene pool here is severely skewed. Um, that the kids on standardized tests in Lexington can be a 90 or 92 percentile in Lexington and 99 in, in the country. Uh, and there, all my kids got through school fine, had a great time, excelled in college, and in a, in a different gene pool. So I just wanted to add that to what is diversity in Lexington, and perfection, and performance, and how much pressure we as parents may put on our kids, which is very close to home. Hi, my name is Deb Zucker. Uh, I have two kids in Lexington and we've been here for just three years. And I will say one of the things that impressed me uh, that I found to be unique from other areas where I lived, and I've lived in a lot of different places, um, is how really it is a community of very bright people, but people who also are active and know how to organize. And I think there are a lot of benefits that come with that. But I also see in the town that that kind of organization has led to a lot of silos, and breaking down those silos is something that I think we've really had trouble with. So it's great that we have a Cal and an IAL and a Lex Pride, but when people are, I think what's great about that is people are very focused on the issues and the biases and the diversity and inclusion that affect that particular group, but completely oblivious to the issues and the biases that affect other groups. And we will not truly be inclusive until we break down those silos and we all work together. So I think that's something that, um, that, that I would really like to see. I don't, there's no easy answer to that, for sure. Um, and then the other thing is, is, I think the turnout is great. This is a phenomenal audience. And I, when we hold other events like this in town, it's often the same people. Um, there's a lot of new people here today and we're grateful that, that everybody came. But at other events, we'll have 10 or 20 people and it's the same 10 or 20 people that go to every event. So what we have to do is figure out how to reach you know, the people who showed up here today what is it that inspired you to come today and how can we reach other people so that we can have this, a broader conversation among the entire community and not the same 20 people talking to ourselves. Hi, my name is Margaret. I've actually been here on and off since 1975. Um, I'm a product of Lexington Public Schools as are my kids. and. And I really wanted to say one of our great strengths is this, what I've seen in the schools is a huge effort on the part of the educators to make the curriculum more, uh, reflect the town, but also bring up different viewpoints. It's been really exciting to see, particularly my son who's going to be in 12th grade, um, get to read as a group the book Home Going, which is a fantastic book, which really brought um, to life things that I think many of the kids thought they knew about and they had no idea about. And I really want to continue to see those efforts supported and continued. I have been on town meeting for nearly 20 years and this spring was the most exciting session we've had. Um, we, Dr. Hackett, um, very thoughtfully had selected um, a group of students from Lexington High School to receive a diversity award, this, the diversity award we give out every year. And it was really, I think, one of my, the highlights of my time on town meeting. They had asked that the curriculum at the high school better reflect their experience. They happened to be a group of uh, uh, junior year African American girls. And, they asked that there be a class added to the senior curriculum, um, which is a, you know, all the seniors at LHS get to pick an English elective. They asked that an African American literature class be added. So I, I'm not saying this is a weakness, but I really hope that did not have to go into the void. I don't think it was added in time for this year with Toni Morrison's passing this week. I think it was reinforced even more for me how we have these great figures in our, uh, you know, in our country that really need to be, um, brought under an umbrella of a course at LHS. So I, would, I wanted to just um, bring that up as, as an example of efforts that have been made that I, I think we're really working on it in the schools and those kind of concrete things 
really do make a huge difference. One final thing, my 11th grade son, to my much surprise, picked the newly added course on women's literature to take this coming year. And he said he's heard it's a great course. He didn't pick it because he thought I would think that's a cool thing. He totally made that decision on his own. So, I mean, these kind of efforts really make a huge difference to our young people. And I'm very, very happy at the huge stance Dr. Hackett has taken on that part. And I think many, many, many educators at the forefront have too. So I just wanted to, um, you know, reinforce those things and as a town meeting member, a parent, and a, I guess a very long time resident, although I hate to sometimes admit that. Thanks. So uh, I know that there have been all kinds of hands uh, raised. I'm going to go to the back before coming up front, just to make sure that people in the back have a chance and not just the people in the front. So I will come back to the back and then kind of make our way up front. I'll come up a little bit. So um, Larry Freeman, um, been in Lexington not a very long time. Um, I am on town meeting, uh, but I would like to say that in a town of over 33,000 people, there are actually fewer than 400 African Americans. You know, that's really shocking and amazing when you really think about it. So I would encourage all of you beautiful people who are here today to not to be an idle bystander. When you see injustice or an un uncomfortable situation, please intervene. When you're talking to your neighbors and your friends and they say something that gives you that awkward feeling, just say no, you can't say that. Um, I know here at the library we have bystander training that will teach you how to address those situations so that maybe you won't feel awkward. But if you make it part of your everyday life, then it will become a comfortable space for you. Uh, my name is Larry Hall, but some of you know me better as husband of Sophia. <laughs> uh, we moved here more than half a century ago, 1966. So probably not oldest resident, but the oldest uh, among the audience here. I just want to relate that some quite humorous incident happened more than half a century ago. First year we moved in. Uh, the unsequel today, but uh, kind of uh, looking back, interesting. Uh, I was driving home from work, made a right-hand turn on Bedford Street onto Revere, onto back to my home. Forgot to signal the right turn. I was immediately pulled over by a police car, accident police. Wants to know what I'm doing here. So when I showed my driver license registration, he was very surprised. So I live in Lexington <laughs> because at that time I was a number of Asians or particularly Chinese living in Lexington very long distance. So he got somewhat apologetic and said, you know, pull me over for that little incident that signaled making a right hand turn and let me go. But now, you know, we had a Chinese American Lexington police force for many years now already. But at that time, she is, uh, seems very different. He was actually following me, driving, because he couldn't believe what the Asian driving car in, in the middle of Lexington was doing. So that's why when I didn't signal making the right-hand turn, he, I got pulled over immediately. But nowadays, of course, uh, this is unthinkable. And uh, how far we have come. Our kids, when they started first grade, they were only Asians in the class. Now. 20, 30 percent of the class in Lexington are Asians. So I just want to remind people how things have come and we have really enjoyed here living for over half a century. Thank you. Hi, I'm Deb Saban. I've been here since 1994 and I, I wanted to piggyback on what the gentleman from town meeting said and just think about how the stake that people like me consider myself very privileged to have in this type of conversation um, and talk about a kind of a concern and then something that seems very hopeful. Um, there were some incidents at the high school last spring of uh, 
postings of racist postings, social media postings. And um, when I asked my daughter, who is a rising sophomore now, um, kind of what the reaction was, how it was going, she said, oh, it all kind of blowed over. I checked in with some of the Boston kids and they were fine with it. And I thought, wait, it's not just about whether the Boston kids are fine with it, which it's hard to believe that that is true, but it was about like how the community, high school community as a whole, took responsibility and felt like they were implicated in that and they had a big stake in that. And so that was a real concern. Um, cause for celebration, my husband's actually middle school principal in Waltham. They are dealing with many people arriving from Central America. Uh, he and some other people in the community have organized a trip to Guatemala to really understand where these students are coming from. They had over 30 community members, mainly teachers, signing up, funding themselves to, to take that trip this year to really understand how this issue impacts the community as a whole. So I just wanted to kind of talk about that sense that we, who, are, who have been the recipients of so much privilege, have a tremendous stake in this conversation that we need to acknowledge and take responsibility for. I love what she just said. Um, <clears throat> I agree. I think the school should have taken a little more to talk to the kids about that incident. But um, me and Dr. Hackett have had that conversation a few times. Um, I'm glad that Lexington has so much um, resources, extremely intelligent people, lots of volunteers. We're really lucky to be able to have that. We're lucky to have a huge amount of people come out for conversations on race. So it's important to them, it's definitely important to me. Um, but I appreciate it. I appreciate all of you coming, and I appreciate it being important. And not a lot of towns get together and do these things. So not a lot of the towns have the individual um, groups, which do promote silos, kind of, but at the same time, if those silos got together and you know had dances or parties or or engagements, um, you can still have the silos so that you have your topics and important things that you need to move for your group of people. But then you should also be getting together with other groups of people um, so that we could you know mingle and 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 be friends because that's how you break um, racism. You know, when you find out that, um, you know, the, the Muslim person puts on their same pair of pants the same way you put yours on. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really simple. Um, people are basically the same. You're gonna find bad people in every race. You're gonna find good people in every race. Um, the thing is to look for them. And um, you're not gonna find out who they are until you extend that hand and try to meet them. But I do applaud Lexington for at least trying. Hi, my name is Amber Iqbal, and I have been a, 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 a part of Lexington for the past eight years. And she actually took my words that uh, until you actually meet somebody, you really don't know who that person is. Just wearing a kind of attire or you know wearing a headscarf does not mean that you know um, I'm a terrorist. You know, uh, it's just uh, very important to get to know people, and you know I made some beautiful friendships here, and um, I will tell you a little background of my story why I moved to Lexington. Before this, I was living in Bedford and we were living in this townhouse community and it was around that time when Osama bin Laden was caught in Pakistan. And people in my neighborhood knew I was from Pakistan. So um, uh, one of the neighbors, she actually, she did not know me. Um, uh, our kids used to play outside together and I used to sometimes watch her kids too because she used to be inside. So I would watch all the community kids together uh, playing outside. And so I was just trying to be nice to everybody in my community, just like all our neighbors are together. But then um, she had the courage to tell people in the community that 
uh, I think we should call the police and get her house checked because we never know she has a bomb or something in her house because she's from Pakistan. And I was shocked. Uh, some of some of the neighbors came in and she, they told me about it and they're like, well, this is person said about us and we told they trust you. Uh, we're not here to say that you have it or anything, but we're here to um, extend this hand of friendship to you and a lot of other neighbors who uh, were not, you know, I did not personally meet and um, they came up to me and they said, we're, you know, we know, we, we know you're a good person and everything and don't listen to her and what she's trying to spread against you. And um, that was like something that, you know, you feel like these kind of uh, things happen way down in the uh, Texas or in the South or something like that, but sometimes it's very close to home too, you know. Um, so, uh, that's the point when we thought that this is not the place for us, this is not the place for our kids to grow. And, uh, you know, it was just one experience, but you never know, you know, um, uh, what kind of children go to this school. So, then we just moved to Lexington, and so far it's been a beautiful, beautiful experience. I've made so many beautiful friendships here, and um, it's just been great. And uh, uh, Ms. Julie Hackett, she's been in contact with me about the school and the calendar and putting Eid in it and Ramadan and um, educating the kids about what it is because um, we as Muslims are very much a mi minority here, maybe about 150 families uh, in Lexington. But um, she's been great in you know, educating and telling all the principals of schools to you know, uh, get their children aware of Ramadan and Eid and what it is and um, asking us to come to school and you know, educate people about this. Uh, and I think it's been a great community to us. Before we take more uh, uh, feedback from the audience, I just want to do a time check. So we have about a half hour left. Um, so I, uh, we welcome, we'll, we'll get to you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that, you know, the, the questions that we were posing in terms of strengths and weaknesses, in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion in Lexington, um, any also thoughts about kind of what our vision is for Lexington and what indicators would tell us that we have made it where we want to be, right? So we are where we are now. We might want to have a vision of where we want to get to and what would tell us that we are there. So just kind of additional food for thought in these additional conversations. Um, but they've had their hands up for a while, so I'm going to go to them and then back to you. Uh, I'm Margaret, and I just uh, I want to comment about METCO. Um, it's a wonderful program that I, I had a terrific opportunity last year to mentor in a class in Boston, at a high school called Another Course to College, and it was primarily a black high school. Um, and I assisted a, a history teacher who was introducing a civics program. To these, people, to these kids, and it was a terrific program. It, I hope it continues. But the kids got, in the course of the program, got to choose a topic in their community that really concerned them and that they wanted to you know, do something about it, to get the adults to do something about it. And the topic they picked was murder in their neighborhoods. And it struck me that we have kids in our METCO program here in Lexington who live in those same neighborhoods. And I would just hope that we, um, we learn to follow the news to of, of murders that are happening in Dorchester and in Roxbury and Mattapan and other parts of Boston. And we'll have kids that are getting bust from those very neighborhoods to be with us. And I would like to know that those kids, that we acknowledge them and ask them, how are they doing? How are they doing? Knowing that they're going home to a neighborhood like that. So, thank you. Uh, 
Robert. Um, I know you wanted, so you, you, and then. Uh, Thank you. Um, just, just to put out, I'm an um, early childhood teacher at the Bowman School. I've been there for several years, over a decade. Um, and I've also been teaching, I'm going to be starting my 34th year this year, in kindergarten. And in kindergarten, I can assure you that we have made great efforts to start right away when the students come in. Acknowledging their cultures, acknowledging who they are, acknowledging their favorites, their least favorites. Um, and we have a thing that we do every week, and we have, it's called the important person of the week. A child brings home a full suitcase, it looks like a suitcase. It's the important person suitcase. They come back after a couple of days when they're ready and they present their culture. They present their favorites. They present one of their favorite books. But the side effect that happened was their parents were so curious and so nervous for them presenting in kindergarten that the parents came. Well, with that, that invited parents into my classroom every week. I didn't have, it wasn't formal. It was just something that happened. And as a result, we learned more and more and more about every student. This important person of the week creates this diorama at school. It's something they bring all the parts in and we, we build it together. And then the parents, if they are there, they help with that. They also represent their language, their culture, their favorites. And several parents then later had a potluck that's off campus because we don't eat in schools at Lexington, aside from the cafeteria. And the off-campus um, potluck turned out to be, it seemed like, you know, eating around the world. It was wonderful. So I am um, from a very large family, and I am not very Irish, and so the children were just laughing hysterically that I had never heard of half of the foods. And they loved the fact that they could teach me how to say it, what it tastes like, and they also just really enjoyed the fact that whenever I tried something, I'm famous because I'm a picky eater. So one of them said, see, she's a picky eater, so now I can be a picky eater. <laughs> but the way to bring families in accidentally was kind of a lovely, lovely side effect about learning about all their cultures. But just quickly, I just want to give everybody a quick reminder that um, not uh, every African-American student in school is in the METCO program. And so just to be you know, thoughtful of that, your parents are here, maybe their parents would like to be welcomed too. So. Thank you. So, uh, she was gonna speak first, then you. Hi, my name is Narayan Bhatia. We came to Lexington in 1973. So we have been part of lots and lots of these kind of meetings. But the best thing I have seen is this. It's very, very important. I think every kid in the school should have this. What is equality and what is equity? You asked, where do we want to be? We want to be equity column not equality column. Equality, diversity, maybe intellectual exercise. Equity is where we end up if we take all the actions that are necessary to do that. And for that, I have two prescriptions. One, let us find out all those silos, what they are, where they are, how many they are, what is important to them. Let us find ways of meeting them and getting to know each other and learn from each other. I don't know what is important to Jews. You don't know what is important to Hindus. I don't know what is important to Chinese. Nobody knows what's important to all of us. We must know what is important to us, at what stage of life. In the beginning, it is children's education. At the end of life, is something else, it's cremation. I want to be cremated. There's no crematory in Lexington. So we must learn from each other. We must know what is important. And to our second prescription is that we don't have any data about of silos, about diversity that exists in the town. No data. 
Asians. Asians are of many kind. And uh, you can break your head and if you make an argument, you say, what, how do you back it up? It's an intellectual town. I don't have data. So a, a town should start some programs to collect good data about diversity that exists now and update it every four or five years. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maria Froman. I've um, been living here for 13 years, but my husband grew up here. I just wanted to share a thought. Um, the month of June, I was extremely impressed with all the posters they were on the lamppost all through Lexington Center about Pride Month. At first, I was surprised um, that it was such a big deal. I was surprised that there was such a presence in the town because I was just not aware. Um, I understand now that I learned that it was a big year, a big anniversary. Um, and I was excited. And it felt like a celebration, and a celebration for the whole town, not just gay, lesbian, trans, queer people. And I wonder if that would be a way of continuing the trend with all the silos going public and raising that awareness. It's such a, I mean, it's superficial, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. And becoming public and noticing that it's, it's, it's the whole town, because he was in the center and we saw it all the time. So I just gotta say that I, I love that and I wonder if we could have more of that. Thank you. Um, one thing that I just wanted to mention also in terms of uh, the silos, and I think I really appreciate some of the, the comments that we've had, is that we are not actually all kind of separate in this way, in that, for example, people with disabilities cut across all demographics, right? All races, all ethnicities, all sexual orientations. People um, who are LGBT cut across all demographics. And when we divide ourselves solely by faith or solely by race, we are asking these people to cut themselves into pieces and be recognized for only one part of who they are. And so I appreciate like your comments, some of these comments that recognize that we have multiple identities and we all are um, we all benefit when we celebrate all of all of these identities. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have a couple back here, and then I'm going to come back. So uh, Brent, I know you've been waiting. I'm Brent Miracle, pastor here. I've lived here for seven years, and if I can borrow this one, Noreen already held it up, but. Um, one of the things that I often talk about when we talk about inclusivity is that um, we actually have an opportunity to to be included. We talk about exclusion, uh, but uh, we live in a, and it's been mentioned that we live in a society uh, here in Lexington of affluence and education. We have to be careful with our education that we've done so much uh, research on our own that we begin to exclude people who are trying to include us. What do I mean by that? Uh, we're, it's funny, you mentioned 100 uh, Islam uh, people in, in Lexington. I represent probably less than 20 American Indians who live in Lexington. And uh, there's been so much uh, talk of inclusion, but when, uh, but when an actual native shows up, all of a sudden we don't know anything because you've already read all the books. Uh, a good example is, what are you being excluded from? You're being excluded, uh, a good example here in, in Lexington, my, my, my son plays lacrosse. And uh, he's on the Iroquois National Development Team. He plays for uh, a very elite team that just barely got knocked out of the finals in Canada. Uh, but he couldn't play lacrosse here. He got benched. And we tried to, we tried to, to get the team included in, in this but uh, he was excluded. Um, now he's gone to a he's going to a prep school uh, for a full ride scholarship to play lacrosse because his talent was was recognized and they wanted him because he's a Mohawk 
And the fact is, is that the game of lacrosse was given to the Mohawks by the creator. It's our game. And uh, he was being excluded from the very game that was given to us. And so I, I bring that up is that there's, a, there's an opportunity to be part of a story. And the power of this equality and equity picture is that the tall man had an opportunity to be part of a story. His inclusion wasn't just inclusion, but, but the little boy gets to include him in his story. Does that make sense? And, and, and the question we have to ask ourselves is what part of the story do we want to be part of? Do we want to be a part of the one that on the negative side, like my son? Or do you want to be part of the positive side, which obviously has gone past, but we get to have a choice to, to do better next time? Does that make sense? So we're talking about inclusion. We're also asking, what are we getting to be included in? Not just, what are we getting to include others? And then on the opposite side, what am I possibly getting excluded from in this story when I'm with somebody and I don't decide to, to listen to them because they probably know, but because I've done all the book research, I'm, I'm afraid to ask. Does that make sense? So. Um, I would actually just note that we actually don't know what the genders of the people in that, <laughs> that picture are. Um, so, uh, I know we have uh, Jesse yep. and then Jerry. Uh, was there someone over here too? Oh, go ahead, and then we'll... Thank uh, you. My name is Roland Gibson. I'm not from Lexington, but in 1972 I worked at Diamond Junior High School as a social studies teacher. And I have a question for you. How comfortable are adults in this room with students having a more balanced view of the American past? Are you with me? Yeah. With all due respect to the preamble and the Constitution, both of those documents were flawed. Why? They did not include people that looked like me. They did not include women. They did not include native people. They did not include people from that were not Europeans. Are you with me? Are you comfortable with students understanding that? Are you comfortable with students understanding, I don't see the American flag, that the American flag was a symbol of oppression in this country? Are you with me? I want you to think about the cultural norms in the United States of America. In 1965, when I came to a neighboring community to teach in the suburbs, the cultural norms were not inclusive. Are you with me? I want you to leave you thinking about what it's going to take for you and for the town of Lexington to create change in cultural norms. This is not a cerebral exercise. When you ask yourself the question, what kind of country do we want to be? That's a very complex question. And I commend you, you have courage to ask these kinds of questions and then act on it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and as Melanie said when we started out, we do really want to quickly uh, start from the kind of brainstorming conversation that we're having now to future conversations that are action-oriented. And in fact, the last question that I was going to pose to the group is, you know, thinking about where we are now, thinking about where we want to be, kind of what kinds of actions can we take? to get from here to there. 
we obviously can't cover all of that. We just have a few minutes left. So we want, we encourage people to email us with ideas and suggestions. We will have more of these community conversations that are action oriented so that we can in fact talk about how do we, in practical terms, how do we get from here to there. Um, so we'll have a last uh, couple of questions and then, or, or comments rather, and then wrap up with the understanding that we would like, the Diversity Advisory Task Force would like everybody to be as involved as you feel comfortable being. That is different for, for every person, right, depending on your circumstances. So we welcome your involvement at whatever level you feel able um, and would like to participate in. Email us, participate in future conversations, spread the word, tell us it's in practical terms. What will tell us that we are where we want to be? Where do we want to be? And in practical terms, what does that mean? How does that manifest? What would things look like when we get to that place where we want to be? And how, in practical terms, can we get from here to there as individuals, as a community, as a town, in the school system? So a couple of more uh, comments, and then um, we'll need to wrap up. I know people have a lot more that they want to say, and I apologize that our time is so short, but we will have more conversations. So um, Jesse, and then. Thank you. I'm Jesse Steigerwald. I'm a town meeting member. First, on the opportunities we all have, I know Melanie Lynn is here. The town, through the town celebrations committee, still continues to fund every other year a dance around the world. And it does one of the things Deb talked about, which is having different cultural organizations partner together for an open event that everybody can come to and share and celebrate each other's traditions. So I think that's a strength that our town has figured out a uh, biannual rhythm. Secondly, there's a community coalition, and all the cultural community groups in town, including Let's Teen Us, which is brand new, are part of it, as well as our arts council. I see Christina here from Monroe. Um, Lexington Council of the Arts is part of it. Um, but those coalition members, actually also the Historical Society, are trying to work on problems as a community that can't be solved by one group alone in a silo. And we added the diversity and celebrating our inclusiveness together. To that end, we've talked about, and we will decide on August 16th, if the book for this year is going to be a book called White Fragility. So I'm just going to say a sentence and use all of you as a quick focus group. The question about this book is, while we have different people represented here based on socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, uh, orientation, all different slices of life, we are still predominantly a very white community. So this book, White Fragility, is really addressed at having people who are white think about what assumptions they might be making. There's lots of books about race. There's lots of books. Waking Up White is another one um, someone told me about. So I'm just going to ask you who are here briefly for a quick show of hands. The question that came to us before we finally decide for sure on August 15th is, is our community ready to have a community discussion about the book White Fragility? So if you feel that, yes, that would be OK, I would just ask you to raise your hand. Then I'll ask you, if you feel like we're not ready, then I'll ask you. Do you feel like we're ready to have that conversation? Great. And then do you feel like we're not ready and you think we need to prepare ourselves for that dialogue? OK, so I had to ask that while I was here sitting here. <laughs> So thank you, that's great feedback. Um, there are coffees called Welcome Coffees every month, and Valerie's been part of this effort. To that point, everyone here could come and help be a host. Just pick one coffee. There's daytimes and there's evenings, and we are welcoming each other. People come who've lived here for 20 years, but they were busy with kids, jobs, and they want to show up and meet new people. So anyone here can come and help. Um, last thing to your other question, how do we measure where we are? I would look at the whatever you think the most successful is. If you think AP chemistry is the most successful thing, I would look at the kids in the class and I would see if there's a full representation of everyone in our community. If there is no black child in that class, I don't think we close the achievement gap. I would look at town meeting members and say, how many people are in town meeting who are white? No offense to our fabulous five selectmen, but they're all white. So I would say until you see diversity at whatever you think is the most successful level across, then, then I hope you guys will look at that. Good morning. My name is Felicia, and I'm 
work for the town of Lexington at the Meco office in Lexington. Um, what I have to say is very brief. Um, I was recently faced um, with having to decide whether I was going to move out of Lexington. I've been here for about 20 years now, and it took my 15-year-old to look at things from a different perspective. Um, I started looking in all areas because I don't own a home I rent. And I said to my 15-year-old uh, son, Jazz, I said, Jazz, you know, I really cannot afford a place in Lexington. This is getting to be too much for me. So I started looking in Waltham, Belgrade, uh, Arlington, you name it. And one day, driving home, he said to me, and I know this has nothing to do with religion while we're here. He said, Mom, you have to have faith. God has a plan. He said, this is where my roots are. I've been here since I was three years old. How would you feel if your mom removed you from everything that you have known? Jazz plays sports for the town of Lexington. Jazz plays AAU sports. He's, most of you probably know him. Um, if anybody is involved with sports or at the high school, you probably know who he is. He's a very intelligent 15-year-old. So with that being said, I said, you know what? I'm going to take a risk and thinking that my 15-year-old at this time is a little bit smarter than I am. <laughs> and I'm just going to have a little bit of faith. And I'm going to continue looking at Lexington until I find something. But just this simple fact that he sat in that car and tears running down his face and saying, I cannot leave Lexington. This is all I know. Please don't do this. And I just want to thank each and every one of you who do know me and the ones that don't know me. Thank you for being so accepting of our family um, and just always giving a helping hand. Um, I can honestly say that though I am half black, half Dominican, I feel like this is the only place that I've actually fit in. So thank you. Thank you. I want to get back to what Jim had said earlier about um, kind of having a range of housing that people of all different levels um, can afford. So we just have like two minutes left. I know there are a whole bunch of people who wanted to talk. So did you want to say something? So if we could have like one, two, three, and those will be our last three, and just if you can keep it as brief as possible. Uh, yes, Melanie. If you could just, uh, I had passed out and I'm making today. If you could send the uh, sign-ins just back this way so we can collect them. Right, so the sign-up is going around, so uh, if you need to leave promptly, if you can. Just make sure that you sign that if you would like to be on our list of people who are interested in future conversations. All right, so uh, so last three quick comments, and I apologize for cutting people short because I know there are a whole lot more people who would like to speak. You. Hi, my name is Vikram. Uh, I'm sure I've been living here for about six years. Um, I have some uh, just extension of all of your ideas. Let um, me just take a few, just a minute. Um, one of the solutions to these problems is sending out surveys to minor minority communities. There are several surveys, because I've used some data analytics before to improve quality in medical education uh, in New York City. Um, that is where these ideas come from. Sending out surveys to these minority communities, there are certain sub formats available online through the uh, National Institutes for African American Studies or disparities. Uh, which we can send out the surveys to the community um, to get better feedbacks. The second thing, one of the special education, kids with special education, how do we know they're doing good? How do we know how Lexington is doing good? Um, 
there's no, nobody knows. Um, people in Ohio, people in uh, Midwest, they are doing much better because they don't have resources for inclusion. And as such, the kids with special needs are being included in incorporated in regular classrooms. So new studies are coming up showing those kids are doing much better. So how do we improve our kids with special needs? And do we send surveys to parents with special needs to address their problems? Um, so this is where some of the solutions uh, can be addressed. Thank you. Well, for having your success. Was that the question? How will you know this project right. is succeeding? It's yes. really quite simple. Every student graduating from Lexington High has an illustration of liberty and justice for all, which they repeat every day in school. They can claim, as a town, Littleton has, uh, not from Littleton, in case you didn't know this, Lexington has done this, and they can claim personally, I have done something to fulfill liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Narayan's making me stand up, and I always do what Narayan says. Um, I just wanted to, to respond to um, your question about uh, how, how do we kind of, I don't think you use the word quantify, but how do we, how do we measure um, uh, how we're doing here? And I, and I wanted to say that when we, when we vote, we're ter caretakers of our community, and our voting rates in our town elections are very low. And I think that when we see those numbers go up, and I'd like to see them be sky high, we'll know that we're doing very well in, in taking care of our town together. Thank you. Because that is a measure of community engagement. Um, Matt, thank you. All right, I do promise to keep it very short, because I think I'm the last speaker. But um, <laughs> um, this was a great conversation. I'm really excited to see that this is taking place. And, I think we can even begin today to start taking some of those actions just here in this room even. you know, um, I'll just mention briefly, I love the Bowman program. My daughter has gotten to experience it. Comes home talking about all the time. I'd love to see that in every school, every level. Just, it's an incredible program. And it's something we should be working on. I know Superintendent Hack has done incredible things and so really care about this, so thank you. Um, but just even here as individuals, we can start taking action. If you don't know someone in this room, say hi. You know, just start meeting other people. But that's a great way to start making real progress on this, is just to get to know the, the other. And then suddenly, they're no longer the other. And remembering, of course, no one speaks for their group. There is no, that everyone is an individual. But you can't learn anything about another group. You can't get to be part of a broader society if we don't take that first step of just talking to somebody else. So that was my thought there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you for all of your comments. Thank you for your engagement. Please do um, sign our list if you would like to be included on our list of people who are interested in future community conversations. Please do email us, spread it around. Um, we would like to hear from anyone and everyone who has thoughts. If you would like a copy of the Constitution in English, or in Chinese, Korean, Arabic, or Spanish, and Japanese. We have copies of the Constitution right over here. Uh, Megan and Samantha have copies. Um, I would especially like to thank our speakers and our panel. Thank you to Jim Malloy for taking the time out as town manager uh, to participate here and to spend the time both speaking and listening. Thank you to Dr. Jackson for being here. We are going to hold on to you here in Lexington for as long as we possibly can. We are, we are glad that your, uh, your uh, kids and grandkids live here so that you will <laughs> be a presence here in town. Thank you for coming to speak here. I know that you know everybody wants a piece of you. So <laughs> I appreciate your, well, I don't think that came out right. So <laughs> um, 
So th thank you for taking the time here for participating. Thank you to members of the Diversity Advisory Task Force for showing up at a time that I know uh, most of us are often at work and so forth. But most of all, again, thank you to all of you. Thank you to our community leaders of all types. That means citizens who are community leaders as well as our elected officials. Um, please do email us. We will send out as soon as we nail down the dates um, for future community conversations. Um, and we will also be communicating out information over the next few months about um, block neighborhood block parties to bring all different kinds of people together as well. Thank you again. Thank you so